the results coming out of what is going on with retirement in America are not that good on either side. It, you have uh, most of the people with not enough to retire who haven't accumulated enough because we're encouraged to be grasshoppers by our society. We live in a consumer society. So even if you're sort of in the middle, you'll get pushed into the grasshopper area if you're not thinking about it. But then we have the ants who have accumulated and they are ready to retire. But what we've seen from the statistics is that there are extraordinary numbers of people who are essentially afraid to spend their money, not spending their money in retirement. The strategy of not spending money always works in retirement. It's just not very optimal. And it's not something that everybody can do unless you are seriously oversaved. And so for me, the challenge was, well, wh where's the middle ground? Where is that ant hopper ground that I'm not just keeping storing up and accumulating more and more assets like, like these folks are, have been doing, but I'm not gonna run out of money, which is obviously the, the fear uh, that people have. Now, the other issue, and I think the more difficult issue for people at the beginning who are just, who are trying to catch up to buy is actually just sitting down and calculating those expenses, that kind of grunt work of looking through all of my receipts and credit card stuff and bank accounts and all of that stuff. That's what you actually need to do to start. And there's no shortcut on that. It's, it's not hard, but it's grunt work and it may be <laughs> unpleasant for a lot of people who don't like looking at a lot of numbers and things, but that, that's the first step. Find out what your expenses are. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. Hello, and welcome to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount with my co-host, Becky Heptig. And today we have Frank Vesquez with us on the show. Becky, how are you doing today? I'm excited. Oh, well, I am too. I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun because the bottom line is Frank is a goofball. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to have fun. And, and just, I'm going to say, I apologize for my voice. I have a cold. I sound like a frog. So I'll be croaking through this episode. Well, maybe our virtual assistant, new sound editor, can take out the frog in your voice. You never know. <laughs> Gosh, that'd be nice. <laughs> All right. Well, let's introduce our guest so we can get it rolling. Frank Vesquez is a mostly retired lawyer with over 30 years of experience in investing for his own accounts. He holds degrees in economics and engineering from the California Institute of Technology, as well as a law degree from Georgetown University. He is extremely active in the financial independence community, answering questions of all types in forums and Facebook groups. He has appeared as a guest on Choose FI, the What's Up Next podcast, and Security Analysis podcasts, and runs workshops at the Economy Conference. His involvement in FI topics and issues predates the FI community as it is known today. Frank and I first met at FinCon 2019 in Washington, D.C. My wife and I had drinks with him and found his wit and wisdom quite entertaining. His laugh is an unmistakable fingerprint and can be heard far afield. He is founder and host of Risk Parity Radio, a laboratory or dive bar, as he calls it, devoted to asset allocations for the DIY investor and drawdown portfolios. One of Frank's guiding meta principles that you will hear on his show is, quote, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines, end quote. That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Another meta principle is, quote, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own, end quote. And that's the famous Bruce Lee. Most importantly, Frank loves waffles, and so do I. Now, Frank can say he has been a guest on the Catching Up to Five podcasts of the hundreds he's been on. Welcome to the show, Frank. Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, baby! <laughs> Here we go. And Thank you for having me, Bill and Becky. This is going to be fun. As you know, I like screwing around and talking about personal finance. Awesome. Um, awesome. So very happy to be here. <laughs> Great. So, Frank, I understand that some of your podcast listeners have likened themselves to people who are fans of the Grateful Dead. Why is that? 
Well, one of my listeners explained this to me recently. He said, your podcast is, is, is oddly compelling, but it's like what Jerry Garcia used to say. And he used to say, they're, the Grateful Dead is kind of like buttermilk or black licorice. There are only a few people that really like it, but the people that like it really, really like it. Uh, and so I have um, a, a small audience, but a very loyal audience and a very active audience. And uh, if, if any of them are listening to this, I, I thank you for being my audience because I know that uh, my style um, is kind of a cross between Charlie Munger and Mel Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, I've listened to your podcast, and that is so true. We'll talk a little bit <laughs> with some George Carlin and Robin Williams thrown in. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the show for our high level listeners. But I want to know first, how did you find that you were drawn to the fire fire community? You are so prolific in the space, answering all kinds of questions. Where do you hang out most, and why do you do this? Well, I think the Phi community found me, actually. I have a whole podcast talking about the history of the Phi community. It's number 276 if you want to go listen to it. But basically, I was involved in this prior to there being what you know as the Phi community today, prior to any Mr. Money Mustache or the Choose Phi. This goes back to early retirement extreme with Jacob Lund Fisker. And I used to hang out on that board with a lot of other <laughs> interesting people, shall we say, all, all introverts, all interested in, in finance. And it kind of grew from there. And I saw then people coming into the space that seemed more normal or more appealing to a broader general audience. And I do remember, I, I remember when Jacob Lund Fisker, who was not interested in being a public person that much, basically handed over the reins to Mr. Money Mustache and said, well, why don't you all you guys go listen to him for a while? And then when Brad and Jonathan appeared with Choose FI, um, I think I probably was one of their first listeners and the first person in their Facebook group and sort of settled in there as a sort of a place to be and, and talk about a lot of these things. And so the uh, I've actually been interested in this topic for about, 30 years or as long as I can remember, really. And I, I view this as the, the most recent iteration of something that's very old. Well, I want our listeners to know that you hang out in our community as well. You hang out in Choose FI. Do you hang out anywhere else that people can find you? Yeah, there is a, a group run by Andy Panko, and it, it used to be called Taxes and Retirement. It changed its name. I think it's called Retirement Education. It's another mm -hmm. Facebook group. The, uh, and I know you've got a couple of different groups that I hang out in. Yeah, we're honored to do so. And, and you're very generous in answering questions of our late starter community to help them with their journey. Today, we're going to talk about drawdown. It's a topic that is really not talked about much in the fire community. This is probably a little bit because people haven't reached drawdown. Uh, the community hasn't been around for that long, uh, at least in its current iteration. And the drawdown philosophies are being talked about more and more as our young firees are reaching the point that they have to live on their portfolios. Why do you think this topic is not talked about much in the FI community? Well, I think, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the first comment, which is that at least this iteration of the FI community has not been around that long. And so there aren't as many people who are getting to their decumulation phase. It's been, it's mostly focused on getting your accumulation going and the techniques for that. And so it's only been in the past few years, I think that uh, you, you saw numbers of people getting to phi and then kind of wondering what to do. And it's interesting when I talk to Diana Merriam, who goes to a lot of these camp fives and things, she says, every five person I talk to says that their only regret is they waited too long before pulling the plug on whatever else they were doing. Because I think it's a scary thing and it's more complicated because you end up having to deal with what is your kind of personal burn rate expenses? How does your life, your individual spending life look? Because it, it's going to look different for each 
different person and each different person is actually going to have a, a little bit different in terms of resources and then your age factors into this as to what strategies you're going to be using because if you're way under 59 and a half you have to use a series of strategies to get your money out of your retirement accounts and things like that if you're over 59 and a half you don't have to be thinking that much about that but you then you have to think about timing social security and other uh, issues that are more traditional retirement kind of oriented so what happens is that it ends up being a little bit different for each person but if you look at all of the different strategies that somebody uses, it's overwhelming. And most of, the, most of the things that could be used will not apply to any one person, but a certain segment or a certain set of parameters will apply to a, a group of people who are usually around the same age and have the same kinds of assets. You talk about ants and grasshoppers. We need to understand that one. I think th this is a, a, a good way to frame the way people are and how they approach their finances in, generally. And, and the difference between, between ants and grasshoppers, this goes back to Aesop's fable. Aesop's fable was you had the, the ant and the grasshopper, and the grasshopper was partying all day long and eating all the food that, that it could find, and the ant was storing away the food all summer. And then when it got to wintertime, the, the ant had the food and could live on that, and the, and the grasshopper essentially starved. That is actually only the first chapter of that story, though. The reason that story is relevant is that you can categorize people as ant-leaning or grasshopper-leaning. Either you have the predilection or preference to be a saver, and I was like that, or you are more uh, of the spender type. And so, so you and Becky fall more on the grasshopper side of things. Another nice podcast that you did with Sarah Catherine Gutierrez, she's also a grasshopper. And, and the way that she talked about things like sinking funds help you out. But the reason that's important is because there is a value to being both things, depending on where you are in life and what time of life it is for you, because the problem with being an ant is you are still going to die at some point. And so you need to live that life. You need to actually eat that food or do something with it. Uh, otherwise, you're really not, you're missing the point of having accumulated that. Now, although that's an old fable, there is modern psychology that describes the preferences that people have. It's a book written by a guy named Philip Zimbardo. This is 10 or 15 years ago. Everything I remember is always 15 years ago because I can't remember when I read something. <laughs> but anyway, in that book, he categorized basically five different sort of personality preferences or personality types. And one is called present hedonist. And that is essentially a grasshopper. That's why you named a boat called YOLO. <laughs> pure grasshopper <laughs> behavior. Um, that, that, that's our with first some really episode. long legs. <laughs> <laughs> that what you are looking for is current enjoyment is your uh, ordinary kind of personal preference. Now, these are not immutable characteristics, but it's sort of like, if I'm not thinking about it, this is kind of what I do. An ant is somebody that's future oriented. And so they're always thinking about saving for the future, doing things for the future, and oftentimes has trouble enjoying the present. And so where this matters when you get to your decumulation phase, basically you've, if you've been a good accumulator, you're a good ant, you've exercised your, your ant muscles. But once you get to the accumulation, you could still be an ant, but you're going to end up taking all your money to the grave with you if you just keep accumulating. So you have to come out of that and exercise some grasshopperness um, because you're running out of you're running out of life, and we're not we're not that old yet, but we're not that young either, uh, and so we need to think about how how to then use that pile of food that we accumulated with our ant muscles as grasshoppers, or preferably uh, what I would call an ant hopper would be the, uh, the ideal, <laughs> the, the ideal focus where, where you are not sitting, sitting on your accumulated assets forever, 
but actually getting some enjoyment out of them and seeing some enjoyment out of them, or at least giving them on to the people who are going to get them anyway and enjoying doing that. Because there's a real struggle for ants when they get to decumulation as not being able to spend money. And Frank, this is the real conundrum is I, I was a grasshopper for a very long time. Then I had to put on ants clothing in order to get myself where I needed to be. And yeah. now I'm sort of back to being a grasshopper. And you mentioned earlier a- about timing. And when Stephen and I retired and tried to figure out the decumulation, we kind of thought like, oh my gosh, I- I've how-, how do I do this? Like we were the only people in the world that were struggling with this. And people have been retiring and decumulating for decades. But it sort of feels like this is the first time it's ever happened when you have to figure it out for yourself. And there are so many paths you can go down and so many choices you can make. And you want to enjoy life now with what you have accumulated, but yet keep your older self safe. And it's it's not easy. So we're we're really hoping that you're going to help us with this. It's it's not easy, and, and it's because you could be in different positions in life, depending on, are you supporting children now? Are you supporting parents? What other obligations do you have in your expense side or preferences? And then how are your assets organized? Are they lined up? Are they in pensions? Are you going to be relying on Social Security for a good part of your retirement? Are, how are your assets invested? How should they be invested? I, I think the financial services community actually struggles a lot with this themselves because the results coming out of what is going on with retirement in America are not that good on either side. You have uh, most of the people with not enough to retire who haven't accumulated enough because we're encouraged to be grasshoppers by our society. We live in a consumer society. So even if you're sort of in the middle, you'll get pushed into the grasshopper area if you're not thinking about it. But then we have the ants who have accumulated and they are ready to retire. But what we've seen from the statistics is that there are extraordinary numbers of people who are essentially afraid to spend their money, not spending their money in retirement, which leads to this odd circumstance that a lot of this money ends up being inherited. But the people inheriting it are on average age 60 when they inherit their money. So it's created this. It's, it's obviously not <laughs> what anybody would really want because, because you can see that, that people are not, are, are not spending their money. And there are built-in preferences or business models in the financial advisor community, including the AUM model, that encourage this kind of hoarding or keeping of assets forever, which is good for the AUM advisor but maybe not so good for the the person receiving the advice. There are advisors out there who are really pushing back on this now. If you listen to what is, I think, the Retirement and IRA show, Joel Salnier, Salnier, I think he's in Colorado. They, they, They talk specifically about this, about how do we get people to spend their money? Because the, the people who have accumulated enough tend to keep accumulating or not spending their money. And so that is a a real challenge. Now, I think with respect to your audience, though, there is an issue with how much do I really need to save up? Because if you are starting this process of being an aunt at 50, you may get to 65. And do you want to be told, oh, no, you need to actually get oversaved. So you need to work six, seven more years. Or can we find ways to maximize that ability to live on those assets, withdraw those assets, so that we can get more people to retirement without having feeling like they need to oversave and be afraid to spend their money? Because that's a real issue here. What I found when I was approaching this, and I started looking at this around 2009 or 2010, Um, realizing that we were going to reach financial independence in the next decade and then wondering, well, how are we going to manage that? How are we going to deal with this decumulation issue? How how much money can we spend and how much money do we need and all those kinds of questions. And when I looked at what sort of the financial guru people, the people that write the books that you have all their names, you've had some of them on your show, 
I looked at what, what were they actually doing in their own lives and their own circumstances? What kind of portfolios were they holding? What kind of spending were they doing? And what you see from that is there are basically two strategies that these people follow, and they're all ants. And one of those strategies is don't retire. Just keep working. <laughs> <laughs> The other one is spend an extraordinarily low amount of money such that it does actually does not really matter too much how your assets are invested. And if you are spending less than, say, about 3% of your assets, it doesn't matter if you have a 30, 70 portfolio or 100% stocks or 80, 20 or 50, 50 or whatever. Any of those things are going to work. The strategy of not spending money always works in retirement. It's just not very optimal. And it's not something that everybody can do unless you are seriously oversaved. And so for me, the challenge was, well, wh where's the middle ground? Where is that ant hopper ground that I'm not d d just keeping storing up and accumulating more and more assets like, like these folks are, have been doing, but I'm not going to run out of money, which is obviously the, the fear uh, that people have. And so I think finding that middle ground has, has been the challenge and what I've been seeking to do, what my podcast is actually about. Now, finding balance in this community has been the topic of late, finding balance in accumulation and finding balance in decumulation. Let's talk a minute about when late starters are interested in this, what do we need to know about the tipping point between accumulation and decumulation? When do we need to start thinking about it? And, and how do we figure that out in, in, in broad, high-level terms? Well, I think what, what people call the 4% rule works just fine as an estimate of how much you need, um, particularly if we're talking about people who are over 50 years old. That, that, and, and that was based on some work done by Bill Bengen back in the 1990s, taking a kind of standardish, off-the-shelf, simple portfolio of two funds and looking at, well, what's the worst case scenario for all the data we have going back to the 1920s of somebody retiring for, say, 30 years? And it, it was 4.1 he came up with at that point in time on the first go. But that gives you an estimate. You multi so if you multiply your expenses times 25, it's sort of you do it in reverse, that tells you approximately how much you need to start with. Now, that really doesn't tell you anything about how to actually withdraw out of it. But that is getting you an idea of, of, of whether you're close or not. The interesting thing about compounding is that going from having 20 times expenses to 25 times expenses actually usually doesn't take very long. It's only a couple of years, usually, because of the way compounding works, that your assets, if invested in standard kind of index funds, are likely to double every eight or nine years. Uh, so even if you only have 10 times your expenses today, in eight or nine years, you're going to have 20. And then in a few more years, you're going to have 25 and be there. So you're only 15 years from retirement, even if you didn't save any more money. So that estimate is a good enough estimate as to where you need to be. The other issue here is a statistical issue. <laughs> and hopefully this won't be too confusing for your audience, but there is, whenever you are dealing with an, un, an uncertain future, sort of the best you can do are these kind of broad estimates and trying to hone down on whether you think you need 27 times your expenses or 23 times your expenses or 25 times expenses. Actually, you can't actually do that because, because the, the future is uncertain enough that the best you can do is to get within kind of that uh, broad uh, envelope. And that's very frustrating, actually, to a lot of ant people because they want it down to the penny as to how much they need to save based on their calculation, based on some future projections that they've done. But really, all of that future projecting is probably not worth your time because it's never going to exactly play out that way anyway, and you're going to make adjustments along the way. So that basic estimate, though, still holds, I think, for most people. Now, I'd like to be able to say also that that ought, still ought to be a minimum. 
and that people who are saving over 30 times their assets because they're afraid to spend them are, are probably doing themselves a disservice, although it's usually just a couple of few years on either uh, either side of it. But I would like to be able to tell somebody who's 65 um, and getting close that they could retire with 20 times assets and be able to, to work this out. I'm sorry, 20 times expenses. I should more define that when I'm talking about accumulation. I'm talking about accumulation of assets you can actually live on. So it's not the car you're driving, the house you're living in, your clothes. You're not going to be selling those. I'm talking about money you have invested that is available to be taken, taken from and used for your expenses. Now, the other issue, and I think the more difficult issue for people at the beginning who are just who are trying to catch up to five is actually just sitting down and calculating those expenses, that kind of grunt work of looking through all my receipts and credit card stuff and uh, bank accounts and all of that stuff. That's what you actually need to do to start. And there's no shortcut on that. It's, it's not hard, but it's grunt work. And it may be <laughs> unpleasant for a lot of people who don't like looking at a lot of numbers and things, but that that's the first step. Find out what your expenses are. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, and, and I have had some conversations with folks about the point you made that the 4% rule is a great place to start. It's a great target to shoot for when you are accumulating. But then when we decide that it, that we do have enough to stop a full-time job and it may not be to stop work altogether. There's a, a lot of people that still bring in income in retirement, but there, the, the road splits into so many paths at that point. So yes, it does. where do we go from here? And I know a lot of our audience isn't here yet, but it's probably not that far in front of them, which is why I really wanted to talk about this. Yeah, I think, I mean, where you would go from there is to get to essentially an audit of what you, uh, what you have <laughs> in terms of your income expenses and, um, portfolio or accumulated assets. And this is complicated and people have tried to simplify it, but it almost, if you oversimplify what you're doing here, it, you, you sometimes don't get very good results and you end up back at, well, my solution is don't spend money or don't spend much money. And hope to get away from that, but but this is a learning curve. Um, all of this, personal finances in general, and I think, and I know Becky, I've listened to your your story and your interviews, and this this does track what you learn in one Corinthians thirteen eleven, which is when you were a child, you do childish things, and you need to put those things away, and then you move to the next step. In terms of your overall uh, progression in your financial life, you start as that financial baby who may be in debt and doesn't know anything about finances, doesn't even know what their expenses are. What does a financial baby need? They need those baby steps. They need that Dave Ramsey. They need to do that. But once you stop being a financial baby and you get out of debt, you got to put away those things and then you move on. <laughs> mm -hmm. I totally agree. And in your case, you moved on to being a financial child, in which case you were trying to pick mutual funds. And then you signed up for a, a retail financial advisor, which is sort of the obvious thing for somebody who's just sort of looking around, well, well, what's out there? And, but then you learn that try, after trying a few of those things out, you stop being a financial child and you move on to being a financial adult, in which case you are not sort of experimenting around anymore. You're actually applying some solid formulas and most of what is talked about now is talked about in terms of a formula, you know, like, a, 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 like the simple path to wealth, that's a formula. The 4% rule itself is a formula. It doesn't tell you why there's a 4% new rule and not a 5% rule. So you can, you can use formulas and, and probably do what, what you need to do. But, uh, but in terms of understanding where you go from there is you go to principles. And you start asking those questions. Why is it a 4% rule? Could it be a different kind of rule if we use something different or did something different? 
and, and you, the reason you want to ask and need to ask those questions is because you are you do have a more complicated situation when you get to retirement. And we can talk about now what to how to go about sort of going through that progression. Before we do that, I just want to go through the steps here again of your income expense audit because people need to know the isolated items. So you need to calculate your expenses, including taxes, you said. That's number one. You also talk about then look at your pensions and Social Security income. And that's a big issue for our late starters because it's coming soon. Yep. After that, you need to look at what's your business and rental income. And there's a lot of people in the space that do do that. And that's one way of escalating your path to FI if you have the risk tolerance. Then look at your residual payouts. Say you have a business and they're buying you out. That's the kind of thing you want to look at too. And those are all things you look at before you look at, okay, am I going to do part-time work, 1099 work or more W-2 work, but just cut back the shifts kind of like I have. And then you subtract all that from your expenses and are you more or less than zero? That's yes. the basics of, are you there, right? That's, yes, that's where I was going next, that you start with those annual expenses, doing that grunt work of figuring that out and start with what you're currently spending. Oftentimes people get wound up saying, well, my life's gonna be different in 10 years and I don't know what it's gonna be and I don't know how and just stop. All you need to do to start with is start with what you are spending now because chances are, unless you make some affirmative uh, effort, unless you go sell that boat. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. I did but, you know, but you know what? And I said it in the episode, I think the boat turned into a hot tub. <laughs> it morphed. I'm very familiar. I'm very familiar with the parameters of that hot tub. Although I'm not actually sat in it yet. You know, happy wife, happy life, and uh, she'd been on me about it for nine years, and and she used she used the ultimate strategy. This is a taking stock Jordan Grummet thing. She said, on your deathbed. Are you going to regret having not given me a hot tub? And I'm like, okay, I can't do anything with that now. That's a done deal. She plays the death card. And what's your obituary going to look like? I didn't make my wife happy. Well, you can't not do that. Yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was a good choice of expenses on your part. That's right. That's right. I, wanted, I wanted to take that money and just invest it and retire sooner and cut back on my shifts. So, but that wasn't going to be the case. And so, yeah, it delayed retirement a little bit. She doesn't necessarily see that way. That way. <laughs> it's like, how many years of compounding is that, Bill? It's probably well, six months. What? 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 <laughs> well, at least it's a one-time expense. Yeah, there's obviously maintenance costs. I got to change the damn filter. I got, I mean, it adds more work. It's like, it's the burden of too much stuff. And she doesn't necessarily look at it that way either. You could be buying tires four times a year. <laughs> well, when, you, when you guys finally come up with your 10 steps of catching up to five, I think step number three is going to be called sell the boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you said before that the steps to getting to five don't change for the fire community or the late starter fire or retire on time or retire eventually. It's 10 to 15 years, no matter how you slice it, which is why we want to get people started latest at 50, because that gets them at least retiring at 62, potentially early or on time. Yeah. Uh, let's circle and, back. And that's the, and that's a good goal. And, and I think that's why when, when we're looking at this inventory, which is Take your annual expenses, and as you said, we separate, we subtract pensions and Social Security. We, we subtract business rental income. We subtract any other residual payouts you may be getting, and any part-time or continuing employment income gets you to all right. Well, this is what needs to be covered. But for most people, that pension or Social Security, if you're late to five, that that's probably going to be a significant portion of what we're talking about here, which is a completely different discussion that I know you've had. And, and there's a calculator you've referred to that I can't remember right now. Security.com. 
Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, of of um, Mike Piper's calculator. I can't remember what the oh, it's like yes. optimized or optimal Social Security. Yes, um, yes. Open Social Security, I think it is. Well, op yeah, Open Social Security is the free one, and then there is yeah. there is a paid, and that's the one that yeah we'll get it in the show notes. Knowing what your parameters are there is going to be very important for you to decide: Am I ready or? Do I need to wait or those sorts of things? But after we've done this calculation, then you have a residual amount of expenses that need to be covered by whatever your assets are that you've accumulated. Um, okay. Well, good news for you, Frank, is we're going to have Mike Piper on the show. We've got him coming. So we're going to have an episode specifically on Social Security and when to take it, how to take it, and strategies for yeah. late starters in particular. So that's coming. Yeah, well, that 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 is something that you uh, I would advise everybody to pay attention to if you're anywhere close to that. And I think that's a big difference between somebody who's doing an, an early FI or early fire and somebody who's more our age. That if you're going to retire at 40, you're not going to be relying on Social Security anytime soon. But if you're retiring at in your 60s, you certainly need to know how that's going to mm -hmm. play into this. Mm -hmm. And, and the good news for some of our late starting audience is Social Security can be a big portion of their retirement. In my case, personally, it Stephen and I have broken our expenses out into our base, what we call the base great life or minimum dignity floor. And then we add on top of that to get to the lifestyle that we want. And our Social Security combined Social Security payments are going to cover our minimum dignity floor. Yep. So, so our base expenses will be covered unless eventually inflation may outstrip that. But at least Social Security is also cost of living adjusted. Yeah, but the good news is Social Security is adjusted by inflation. And the even better news is your expenses are unlikely to increase by that same rate of inflation. They're, they're, they're likely not to increase that much. All right. Let's get to the meat of this because this is what people want to know. This is what's not talked about. What are the critical components to a withdrawal strategy uh, that people need to pay attention to? Okay, so yeah, let's talk about, so you've, you've, you've gone through this exercise, you've determined that you have a certain amount that needs to be covered by your assets. And then you are looking at, well, how am I going to cover this? What, what is going to be my plan for my accumulated assets to cover these things? And, and so there are, there are basically five types of ways of covering that. And two of them are contract-based. And, and I'm giving you the whole picture because then we're going to go into to each one of them. And the two of them that are contract-based are you could buy an annuity. You could buy a, a very simple annuity is, a, is you give the insurance company a big pile of money and then they just give you a stream of payments for life. And if you are, say, 70 years old, you buy a joint immediate annuity, that, is, that payout ratio is going to be a little bit over 7% right now for that. That is one strategy. That strategy gets better as you get older because the older you are when you start that, the more it pays. The next strategy is, is called a certainty strategy, and what it is is a bond ladder. So you could take all that money you've accumulated and put it into a series of bonds, and people usually use tips for this because they're inflation protected. And you could buy a one-year one, a two-year one, a three-year one, and keep going all the way up until, uh, uh, until when you think you're going to die. That's the, the main problem with the bond ladder is you have to guess when you're going to die. <laughs> That's kind of hard to figure out. <laughs> one of the paradoxes is and why insurance life insurance works is it's very easy to estimate how many people are going to die out of a population, a large population uh, in a given age. It's impossible to figure out which ones are going to be the ones that die though. And that includes you. So that strategy is difficult to implement and you need to have a lot of extra money essentially to implement a strategy like that. So that's usually only somebody who is, is very well oversaved can implement a bond ladder and expect to get a, a nice series of payments. Although these days you can get around 4% for a 30-year tips ladder or slightly more than that. 
If you're looking for an article on this, we'll have to put it in the show notes, but Alan Roth has done a lot of work on this, right? Yeah, Alan Roth has done one and Bill Bernstein recently did a bond ladder of tips. He's 74 years old and he decided he needed a bond ladder that goes out to 104. <laughs> But you know, he, hey, why not? Both, both of those gentlemen are well oversaved, and they can basically do whatever they want. They, they really don't have a. Uh, they, they can pick whatever withdrawal strategy they'd like, and, and based on their level of expenses, they'll. they'll well, be- one of the things that Bill Bernstein has said, and it's so true, is when you've won the game, stop playing. Yep. And uh, stop taking too much risk, right? Yes. Stop. Stop putting all your money in in 100% index funds or 100% stock market. On the other hand. If you were a person that planned, they had their all of their expenses covered by Social Security and pensions, and they just decided, I'm never going to spend the rest of this money. I'm never going to spend it. I want it to go to my heirs. I'll figure out who that is later. That person could leave all of their assets in 100% stocks because they're not using them, and they're for somebody else. <laughs> This, Becky, this is one of the reasons why this gets so complicated because you have all of these different scenarios and different goals that people might have to either spend or not spend money. And that then dictates or informs what they should be doing. And it's going to be different based on their personal goals. Mm -hmm. Moving along here, though, after those contract-based strategies, Uh, buying an insurance contract, the annuity, or using bonds as contracts in a ladder. The next thing that you're talking about are using a portfolio of assets and then managing that in a certain way to take income out of it over time. And the way that works, I'll talk about three kinds of strategies, but let's just talk about the parameters of what goes on when you put a portfolio together and are taking money out of it? Because it, the three kinds of strategies, either a, a, a static, a dynamic, or a variable, are all different versions of the same thing. Let's go back up and talk, though, about what you're actually doing here when you have this portfolio of funds, stocks, bonds, whatever else you're putting together. There are basically three different parameters here that you're working with or levers that you can pull. You have an asset mix. What are you actually invested in? Is it two funds? Is it three funds? Is it five funds? Is it a bunch of stocks you handpicked? Do you have bond funds? Do you have other municipal bonds or preferred shares? <laughs> or you know, it, there's, there's an unlimited number of things you can invest in these days, uh, which is both good and bad for do-it-yourself investors. They're, but but anything you want, you can get in the in a fund form now, pretty much. You can even invest in cotton and pork bellies in fund forms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, yeah, believe it or not, the, the fund name for the, the fund that invested in cotton is Bale, B-A-L. <laughs> <laughs> There's one called corn, too. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I like eating pork bellies, so maybe I should invest in them. <laughs> so, Have fun with that. <laughs> so, so that is what, what. So one of your levers is what is my asset mix, and going with that, you need two other rules that help that inform that over time. One is, am I going to rebalance this, and how often am I going to rebalance this? Now, let's just take the simplest portfolio, a 60-40 portfolio that's two funds, that's stocks and bonds. Typically, you would rebalance that either once a year, and it's a, so it maybe it veered off and now it looks like a 55-45. You'd sell the thing that, that is doing the best and buy the thing that's doing the worst and get it back to 60-40. You could also set up rules that you're going to do that on specific bands. So you're actually going to look at it every month and see if it's moved 5% or 10%. That can get very complicated when you get lots more assets. But typically, somebody's going to look at that once a year, and that at least once a year, and do this rebalancing to put it back into the parameters that you first set for it. You can also, though, do what's called reallocating. 
which is you are changing the mix of things that you are invested in. And so suppose over time you are following a strategy where you are changing the mix of stocks to bonds based on your age, which I don't recommend, but it's like a <laughs> thing from days of yore when people thought it was a good idea that you should own the 100 minus your age and bonds. The, so, so you could, if you have a reallocating rule, you would look at that every year or every period and reallocate it in accordance with your reallocation rules. Most people these days are not going to have reallocation rules where they're changing their portfolio. It just makes it more difficult to do, and it's questionable as to whether it provides any real benefit. Usually what people are wanting to do is figure out what their base portfolio is, leave it in that, and then rebalance it annually. So that's the first critical component of a withdrawal strategy. What are you invested in? And how are you rebalancing or reallocating it? The second component is what is your base withdrawal rate? Is it 4%? Is it 3%? Is it a dollar amount? Are you going to put it on some kind of a range where you're willing to spend between, say, 3 and 5% in a given year, but it's sort of minimum 3, max 5? That is the second issue or uh, parameter, critical component of a withdrawal strategy. The third one is the withdrawal rate adjustment rules. And what does that mean? Well, how over time, if you start with say 4% of your portfolio, how are you going to adjust that over time? You can adjust it for inflation. You can not adjust it at all. You could adjust it based on your personal expenses, your personal inflation rate. You could adjust it based on what the market did last year. You can come up, there are a, a whole bunch of different rules that you can apply to that. But, but once you have these, these components, these three levers, this, is, this sort of completes a whole withdrawal strategy. If you don't have all these things covered, you don't have a complete withdrawal strategy. You have to know what your assets are, what your rebalancing reallocation rules are. You have them. You have to have base withdrawal rate. You have to have a withdrawal rate adjustment. So as the example, the typical example, when people are talking about the classic 4% rule, what was Bill Bengen looking at back in 1994? He was taking a portfolio. The asset mix was, uh, you, if it's 60-40, he did it, everything going from like a 20-80 to a 100-0 in, in his analyses. But... So, it, so he would take a portfolio that looked like, say, 60% S&P 500 fund, 40% intermediate treasury bonds. That was the asset mix. The rebalancing rule for that was we will rebalance it once a year. There were no reallocation rules. We're going to stay with that portfolio for the whole time. As a base withdrawal rate, he tried different ones came up with 4% as the worst case scenario of a portfolio that would survive withdrawals over, over time. And they withdrew every year. And then the third critical component of this, that withdrawal rate adjustment rule, the withdrawal rate adjustment rule he used there was, we will increase our withdrawals by the CPI rate of inflation every year. No matter whether our expenses, personal expenses increased by that or not, we're just going to spend more every year based on what the CPI does. You can see that that is probably not what anybody does. And in fact, nobody actually does that. <laughs> but the reason he used that as his withdrawal rate adjustment rule was because it was easy to calculate. Everything that he did, he did was, was because it was easy to calculate. So when you are thinking about, well, how am I going to manage my withdrawal strategy? You have all three of these levers to work with. You can change your asset mix, how you rebalance it, how you reallocate it. You can change your base withdrawal rate, and then you can change how you, with, you adjust your withdrawal rate. Uh, and all three of those things are what you're actually deciding when you are creating your withdrawal strategy. All right. One thing we want to talk about, too, and we're going to talk about this at length with Big Earn at some point, 
is just tell our audience a little bit about sequence of returns risk and this scenario of decumulation. What is it and why do we have to worry about it? Okay, the, the sequence of return risk uh, properly understood is why it's a 4% rule and not a 5% rule. And what it means is that if you get a bad series of markets right at the beginning of your withdrawals, that is what makes the withdrawal rate go down, that safe withdrawal rate go down. So when Bill Bangham was looking at all of these 30-year periods he was analyzing, he actually found that in most years, you could have taken 6% of the portfolio out on average, and the portfolio would have survived for 30 years, no problem. In a few years, things were much, much worse, including 1965 or 1966, I think was the, the worst year. And that is the year where you could only take out 4% annually. And so the sequence of return risk refers to the fact that it is that if you would get a bad series of markets where your portfolio is not performing very well right at the beginning of your withdrawals or your retirement, that is why your, your withdrawals need to be lower. That's what you're worried about. Where I think people get confused these days is that there is a popular notion that all you need to do is survive like five bad years. And so I'll have five years of cash and then I'll just put the rest in a stock market thing or something. And that will take care of my sequence of return risk. That's actually not the sequence of return risk you're worried about. That is like saying you're gonna wade across a river that's an on average four feet deep. The sequence of return risk you're actually worried about is a bad decade, a whole bad decade a decade that looks like the 1970s or looks like the early 2000s. And so you, what you want to do is be able to construct a portfolio that is going to be resilient enough to survive a period like that, a worst case scenario. And it's expressed in different ways. The sequence just refers to the sequence of bad years, but it comes out at you as in this is limiting my ability to withdraw. And then this is also telling me I want to have a portfolio that is going to survive or do well during those bad times. And people are usually looking at this historically. Now, the, the other way to look at this is what is called a Monte Carlo simulation. And so you can look at historically what happened and see what, what, uh, what was the worst period, what was the best period. You can also take all those years and all that data and scramble it up in tens of thousands of ways. Pretend the years are coming in different orders. And if you do that, it, it basically gives you this whole spectrum of outcomes. So what if we, what if we actually took the 10 worst years in the last 100 and line them up all in a row. <laughs> what would that look like? Um, and what would it look like if we lined up the 10 best ones in a row? When you're doing what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, you are looking at all of these possibilities, even though what's actually on the very ends is extremely unlikely or maybe impossible to occur because obviously the, the worst or best years in the last 100 years are not going to all occur in a row unless we have bigger problems like nuclear wars or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so you, you, what you really care about is also going into this safe withdrawal rate calculation. Every different portfolio has a different safe withdrawal rate. And I think this is another issue that most people don't understand when they first get into this. They hear some, they hear 4% rule, they think, oh, 4% rule applies to whatever I'm holding. And that's not true. 4% rule only applies to the portfolio that Bill Bangin was analyzing, those kind of portfolios with an S&P 500 and a intermediate treasury bond fund in them, in those proportions. And then what it was called the Trinity study a little later was done that use a total bond fund. 
instead of the S&P 500. So they've calculated all those things and those end up being about 4%. Now, if you change those allocations, you can get higher safe withdrawal rates. That's the secret. And Bill Bengen himself has said, and I wish he would publish this information. He hasn't quite published it, but he's basically said, if I use better things in it, I'd get a 4%, I would get a 4.7% safe withdrawal rate as the worst case scenario. And so what that tells you is that you can, that is one of the levers you can pull. You can change the allocations of your portfolio so that it does better through the sequence of return risk and therefore yields a better safe withdrawal rate. The sequence of return risk is informing you, is part of the calculation of the safe withdrawal rate, essentially. That's the relationship between those two things. Well, that's a great summary, and we'll dive into this more. There's a lot of a lot of complexity to it, but I just wanted to get a high-level view on that. Let's circle back because you've given us all the components here. Can you, and you'd mentioned dynamic strategy, variable strategy, and there's one strategy that Becky actually uses. Can you take us through those strategies? Yeah, so these are the basic strategies that you're talking about with a portfolio that you are withdrawing from that we were just talking about. So in a static strategy, that is what Bill Bengen was analyzing originally. He takes a fixed withdrawal rate, 4%, 5%, 3%, and then he's adding a static increase. In, in this case, whatever the CPI is for the, the, the last year, he's adding that as the amount that somebody's going to spend. And so it bears no relationship it's easy to calculate is what's, and it's easy to use that to compare different portfolios. But in terms of reality, nobody uses that because nobody looks at the CPI and decides, I'm, well, I'm just going to spend that much more money. Instead, you'd look at your actual expenses and they might be higher. They are usually lower for a retiree. And there's research now done by David Blanchett and others that shows that for an average retiree tends to not increase their expenses at the rate of CPI inflation, but something that is basically about CPI minus one. And if you own your own house or you have other expenses that are very fixed, your actual increase in expenses could be less than that. And if you are getting those, getting those kids out the door, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still well, working on that one. <laughs> your expense in retirement could be going down. I know ours are, are going to go down. They've been going down and they probably will continue to go down for some time. If, if that is true, it, it, it changes what the safe withdrawal rate would have been. So if there was, if you did not take, if you did not increase that thing by that withdrawal by inflation every year, and instead just kept it static at 4% every year, it could have been 5% or more than 5% in that scenario. And the reason it's part of the reason it's 4% is the decision to increase it by that much each year. So the other two strategies, dynamic and variable, are variations on that. So somebody who's employing a dynamic strategy is going to be taking is going to be looking at the market performance of their portfolio each year and saying all right it went down therefore i'm going to spend less next year or it went up therefore i can spend a little more sometimes these strategies are referred to as guardrail strategies because you can come up with a variety of different rules about well how much does it have to go up or down before i would change the amount i'm willing to spend out of it. Um, but all of those are dynamic strategies based on the performance of your portfolio. Another, a base, a very basic dynamic strategy would simply to be, simply to say, well, whatever my portfolio is, I'm just gonna look at that at the beginning of the year and the maximum I'm going to spend is 4% of that. And so if, the, if, if your portfolio goes up, you allow yourself to spend more, portfolio goes down, you allow yourself to spend less. The advantage of that is that you can never run out of money. Although you, your spending could go way, 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 way down if you had, you know, if you invested all your portfolio in tech stocks and they went down 80%, then your spending would go down 
eighty <laughs> percent. So, so you probably wouldn't want to don't want to take that strategy with that portfolio. Now the other strategy is called a variable strategy, and that is you are basing your withdrawals on your personal expenses, and oftentimes this is looking at what is your personal rate of inflation or what are you willing to decide is your personal rate of inflation. So one method of doing that would be to say, all right, well, if my portfolio goes down, then I'm not going to take an inflation adjustment this year. I'm just going to spend what I'm going to spend. And if my portfolio goes up, then I'll take an an inflation adjustment. But it's based more on your personal expenses than it than it is on necessarily the market performance. Those two things are very much related. They're they're kind of different ways of adjusting your adjustment, if you will. One is looking primarily at the market. One is looking primarily at your personal expenses. And you can obviously combine those in different ways. Just like what I explained is actually a combination of that. I'm sorry if that was confusing to people. Well, the good news is we'll put this outline in the show notes so that people have a sort of a, a outline version of this and they don't have to take notes. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But it's scintillating. I, I'm sure they're paying <laughs> On the edge oh, of their seat. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I want to ask you a question and, and I'm, I'm circling back to something that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and I want to reiterate our disclaimer that we are not giving investment advice on this show. But you made a comment about that when we were talking about safe withdrawal rate, that you could do better if you had different asset allocation. And I'm sitting here thinking my audience is going, okay, what asset allocations are you talking about? (laughs) Well, the ones I talk about on my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, everybody's going to want to improve their uh, their safe withdrawal rate and uh, mitigate sequence of returns. So what did you mean by that? Well, there are, if you change the allocations or the things you're invested in, uh, history and Monte Carlo simulations show you that you get higher safe withdrawal rates out of them. The simplest change you can make is to do what Paul Merriman recommends and Bill Bengen now recommends, which is to take whatever you're invested in your stock portion and make sure half of that is allocated to value tilted stocks. It's basically using a a factor methodology. If you do that, if you go from having just an S&P 500 or a total market fund as your primary fund, split that with that in a, like say a small cap value fund, that by itself historically has resulted in safe withdrawal rates about half a percent higher. The other sort of rules of thumb, if you will, for increasing your safe withdrawal rate is for your bonds, you want to use the bonds that are the most uncorrelated or most diversified from your stocks. And you, I think you guys just talked to Cody Garrett about this. It means using treasury bonds. Paul Merriman agrees with that as well that the historically corporate bonds are more correlated with stocks and treasury bonds are less correlated with stocks. And so the bond portion of your portfolio should be treasury bonds, unless you're doing something completely different. If you do that, that will also help increase your safe withdrawal rate. The next thing is to watch out how much cash you're holding. And cash includes cash, short-term bonds, anything that would be sort of less than three-year duration. Um, Money markets, CDs, (laughs) all of those things are included in in, in cash as as your cash allocation. Once that gets over about 10%, and Wade Fow and others have done this research, but basically that begins to drag on the overall performance of your portfolio, which which lowers your safe withdrawal rate. So while it feels very comfortable to be holding five, 10 years of cash, it's actually not improving your your safe withdrawal rate overall because it's it's just too much. It becomes Mm -hmm. a cash drag. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that's something that, that people could, out of fear, they might think, well, this is going to solve my problem. When we were talking yes. about the, if you strung the 10 bad years together, well, I'll just have 10 years of cash, but that really is not going to help you any. It, it really is not going to help you because it's, it, it's occupying too much of your portfolio. Then you're, then you're talking about a portfolio that's 30 to 40% in cash. That does not perform well long term. And so you need to have things that are performing well long term that will keep growing. Stocks are the things that grow the most. They're also the most volatile. That's a very popular portfolio these days for people re retiring or accumulating. And, and what, what's interesting historically, there's always something that's very popular with the amateur crowd, essentially. And it's whatever has been doing well recently. So what's popular today is to hold lots of growth related stocks, those, those big tech stocks or funds that hold them, and then lots of cash. And most recently, it, it, because rates have gone up so much, people are just piling into cash like, ah, I gotta get more. I'm <laughs> selling all my long-term <laughs> bonds and buying more money markets and CDs. And, and, uh, the professional people are warning people about this. I was listening to Liz Ann Saunders the other day. Who's a, um, she runs the uh, Charles Schwab's, she's the head of their investment department at Charles Schwab. And she was saying like, yeah, you need to make sure you're not overdoing it there. And actually, although those intermediate long-term bonds have been performing terribly, now is probably the time, it's blood in the streets. Now is probably the time to buy more of them or uh, rebalance into them uh, is what she was saying. But, but what, what's interesting to me is if you go back in time and look at, say, what was popular in different eras, it was different things. It was basically what was doing well recently. So if you go back to the era of your money or your life, and there were other books out then, I have, I have a book on my shelf from 1988 about retiring early at age 35. <laughs> 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 buy is not new <laughs> what was popular then was to put all of your money in high yielding cds because they were yielding seven eight percent at the time that is what people were doing in the 1980s unfortunately that that didn't last um the person that wrote that book uh retire at, at 35 his name is, I think, Philip Turhorst. He's retired now. He's still retired, <laughs> but he had to abandon that strategy and go to a more classic stocks and bonds kind of portfolio. The and I think that is probably what's going to happen to people who are constructing things that look good now or look good for the past ten years, because typically what has worked best in the in the last ten years is not going to be the thing that works the best in the next ten years. And what, so you, what you're really, really thinking about is what is going to work over a 50-year or a 100-year period? What survives in all of these different kinds of environments? Because honestly, we don't know what environment's coming next. We don't know if it's going to be more inflation. We don't know if there's going to be a recession. We don't know. People try to know. <laughs> People hope to know. People get out their crystal balls. <laughs> 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 right. If you listen to my podcast, I have a, a, la a nice lady who talks about her crystal balls and the, how they're good for spying and healing and meditation, and you can connect to the spirit world with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not be using them for your investing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not a strategy. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is a strategy. Any, <laughs> anytime you're looking, listening to financial media, uh, what are they doing? They're getting out their crystal balls. That, that, that's all they do most, for most of the time. It's like, what's the stock market going to be next week or next year? What are interest rates going to be? What, uh, everybody's trying to predict everything based on some indicator or something. It's all, it's all crystal balls. <laughs> and, and so you, you need to put that away. <laughs> And just think about, all right, I want, I'm going to be living with this portfolio for the next 30 years or more, hopefully more like 40. And what do I think is going to survive in all kinds of conditions with the, with the, the humility to say, I don't know what's coming next. 
but it's probably not going to be that much different than something we've experienced in the last hundred years. <laughs> It'll be yeah, and then the, just as an aside note, we had Alan Roth on the show and he had his eight year old son watch Jim Cramer and he lasted a couple of minutes and said, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to SpongeBob. <laughs> yeah, I want to watch SpongeBob. <laughs> well, this is this is why I use SpongeBob clips in my podcast, and I do not use any from Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, the reason I use SpongeBob clips is uh, it, it's trying to, it's to get my my adult children to listen to it because that was one of their favorite things growing up. And I know if I throw things in that if they're interested in it, they'll listen to it's a it's a trick to get them to listen to stuff about investing. I love money. I hate all of you. But it works. <laughs> New tactic. Especially Mr. Mr. Tactic. Crab, Mr. Crab's going on about money. <laughs> I miss money, boy. Money talks. <laughs> All right, there we go. That's that's epic prank right there. <laughs> I don't care about the children. I just care about their parents' money. <laughs> but, Give to the children's fund. What have the children ever done for me? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about management techniques, window dressing, and mental accounting. Uh, and, and these are pitfalls. Can you take us through some of those? Yeah, these are not... The, the, most of these things are not, they're not bad per se, but they, they're not really doing anything or not doing anything helpful. And oftentimes they make things more complicated for people because they think that they're doing something that's either not having an effect or making things more complicated. And, and let's go through a list of what these things are. Oftentimes investors and most beginning investors hear about, okay, well, there's mutual funds and there's ETFs, and they're like, well, which one's better? <laughs> or you have this total market fund and that total market fund, and which one's better? And, and, and the truth is, they're about the same. And, and, for, and in, in many circumstances, they are holding exactly the same thing. So whether you buy VTSAX in its mutual fund form, or you buy it in its exchange traded fund form, which is VTI, which you would definitely want to do if you're not at Vanguard. And, and now you can do that anywhere. That's the, the great thing about investing these days is you don't need to be at one particular broker to, to invest the way you want to, because we have ETFs. That's what the, con the convenience about ETFs. So it, it doesn't really matter that much. I will tell you that ETFs are the wave of the future because they're more efficient, they're more tax efficient, and more people are using them. Mutual funds are the traditional thing. Mutual fund, of the two of them, mutual funds are the early iPhone or the Blackberry and ETFs are the modern iPhone. <laughs> they do the same things. <laughs> you, you could get there with either one of them, um, but ETFs are going to be more efficient in the future. That doesn't mean go out and sell all your mutual funds and buy ETFs. They're not, it, it means pay attention to what's inside them. These are wrappers. I always like to say it's still the same candy in a different wrapper. So, so don't get hung up on the fund wrapper as opposed to what is inside the fund. And it, for learning, it's a good idea to go look and see what's inside your fund just to get an idea. You can go to Morningstar and you can put in any fund you want in their little thing. It's free and go look at portfolio and you can look at the list of what's in the fund and you put in VTSAX or VTI and You'll see, all right, it's got Apple, and it's got Amazon, and it's got Google, and all these big companies, <laughs> so, and you'll see that. So that's, but that's 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 one thing that people sometimes get hung up on is, do I have mutual funds or ETFs? The the next thing people often get hung up on are the specific withdrawal mechanism in terms of, should I take my money out monthly? Should I take it out quarterly? Should I take it out annually? A subset to that is which fund is it coming out of? Because that is uh, oftentimes people are like, well, I got four funds and it's time to take money out. Where's it going to come from? If you have nice, clean rebalancing rules, that will take care of all of this for you because it will come out in the wash. If you have fund A, B, and C, and they're supposed to be each a third of the portfolio, you go through the year and 
you're you're buying or selling out of one of them, probably the one that's the highest one at the time, to take your money out to spend it. Once you get to that that rebalancing phase, you're going to put it back to where it was to begin with. So the, the, the most variation you're going to have is just the time between the two rebalancing. So I, I so you need to set that up, deciding, am I going to take my money out annually, monthly, or quarterly? Oftentimes, for most people, the easiest thing is to do it annually. And so what you would do when you were doing your rebalancing, you would say, okay, and I'm also going to cut out this 3 or 4 or 5% or whatever it is and put that into this savings account or short-term investment, and I'm just going to spend that all year long and not look at the rest of my portfolio and then come back and do it again next year. Which way you do it is more of a personal preference so long as you have adequate rebalancing rules, which you should have for your portfolio. The next thing I think people get hung up on is asset labeling. And this goes to calling this group of assets a bucket or a pie or (laughs) it's always food and gardening implements for some reason. (laughs) <laughs> and and you, and you can do that that's fine if 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 you like it and it, it, it's fine but what you need to bear in mind is that does not change the way your portfolio performs whether you, whether you call it all in one bucket or three buckets or pies or cakes or wh- whatever you want to label it the uh, it, it does not change how it performs the the where where that gets very confusing is if it is interfering with your rebalancing or reallocation strategy. And that is the, the, what oftentimes people put the complicated thing in place involving buckets or something. And then when they're trying to rebalance it, they're like, all right, am I supposed to refill this bucket? And should it come from here or come from over here? The more different designations you have or labels you put in your portfolio, the more rules you're going to have to have to make it all work because you want to have comprehensive rules that are going to cover all situations. You never want to get into a situation where something happens in the market and you don't know what to do because you don't have a rule that covers that. You're more likely to have that problem if you segmented your your portfolio into so many different buckets or groups that you can't easily put it back together. Humpty Dumpty falls apart. And you never want to be in a situation where you are have to, having to make an ad hoc decision. I don't know what to do. I'm going to consult my crystal ball and then do, do it this way. So th- those sorts of things, bear in mind, they can be helpful for, um, for understanding, but they're not, they do not change the, the way your portfolio performs, wh- whether, you, whether you bucket it or do something else with it. It's still this portfolio, it still has the same assets in the same allocations. It does, it does not change the performance of it at all. The next one is bond ladders versus bond funds. Somebody just asked me this question in my last podcast, and I found a nice article from Ben Carlson and Wealth of Common Sense that explained this. So if you're interested in that, go listen to episode 289 to get the, the it, what people think these are, are much different. Again, this is, this is confusing the asset with the wrapper, that a bond does not actually change what it is or what, how it performs, whether it's sitting by itself or it's in a fund. There are management techniques that would go with each one. Bond ladders are generally much more difficult to manage because your duration is changing all the time. It's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So you need to be either buying longer dated bonds or doing something else to maintain the same allocation. Whereas in a bond fund, they're doing that automatically for you. They've all, all bond funds are generally as some kind of ladder. It's like, all right, this is a a seven to 10 year bond ladder, or this is a three to five year bond ladder. And, but who's ever running that fund is, is doing all that management for you. So you don't have to do it. So typically when you're, Working with a portfolio, it's much more convenient to have them in funds. People think that because the fund can go down, you can look on the TV and say, oh, that fund went down yesterday, but my individual bond, it's the same. Actually, if you went out and priced your individual bond, 
it went down in value too. <laughs> it's just you can't look on the TV and see what, see a price for it without having to do some some gymnastics. That is explained in this in this article that I uh, just talked about in episode two eighty nine of my podcast. But when you would want to use a bond ladder is usually when you are when you're doing something separate. Either you're using it as a big strategy. I'm going to actually use this for the next thirty years of my life and be taking money out as it comes off, or maybe you have like a five-year window. And this will often happen for retirees who are, okay, I'm 65, I wanna retire, I have these assets, but I, but I really don't wanna take social security until 70. So that's gonna leave me this hole that, that I need to cover that, that much. I know what I'm gonna get for social security. I need to cover that much for the next five years. So a good use of a bond ladder would be to take part of your portfolio, construct that portfolio, little piece of it, that is that is covering those expenses for the next five years, and then they'll be that will be picked up by Social Security. That's a good use of a bond ladder. A bad use of a bond ladder is trying to include it with a, a larger portfolio with a bunch of stocks and other things. It makes it very difficult to manage, and and, uh, and you can do it, but it's, it's it's going to require a lot of work in order to do it in a comprehensive and coherent manner, in which case you're probably better off with the, with the bond fund. And the truth is, if you hold a bond for the same length of time that you hold the bond fund, you're pretty much going to end up in the same place, even though you saw the, the value of that bond fund go up and down like this for 10 years. The, if you're not selling it or not doing anything with it, just taking the income off of it, the, the, the actual experience is going to be very similar. Okay, the next, the next one is income investing versus total returns. And income investing or dividend investing, as it's, it's ordinarily termed these days, is, is really not a good, efficient way of approaching investing anymore. Historically, and it's my belief that to understand anything, you need to understand the history of it. Historically, this made a lot of sense back in say the 1980s, because at that point in time, transaction costs were really high. And in order to do a stock trade, if you did it with a full service broker, it might cost you hundred bucks a trade. And even with a discount broker, it might cost you 20 bucks a trade. And that's back in 1980 dollars. So you really didn't want to be trading your assets very much. You didn't want to have to be selling a piece of a fund or, or whatever asset. So it's very convenient if you have something that's paying off rent steady income, then you don't have to worry about the transactions. You just take the income and manage that. Or in, in many circumstances, you would take off so much income that you put some back in to what you were doing. That, the, the problem with those kinds of strategies is there, the today is that, first of all, they limit your, your assets. If you are picking things based on that, you are probably not picking the, the most efficient assets that are going to yield the highest returns over time. You want to focus on what's called total return. The, the, um, the other issue there is taxes often, if it's in a taxable account, because it, you have to pay taxes on all of that income, whether you reinvest it or not. Sometimes people think, well, if I just turn on reinvestment in my mutual fund that I don't have to pay the taxes on the income. Yes, you do. <laughs> so it ends up being an inefficient approach to that. The total return approach is the better approach to use these days. The other issue there in terms of picking stocks is there are many companies now use what they call share buybacks instead of paying dividends. So for instance, a company like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, you would generally think of that as a largely value-based company, although it's got lots of Apple in it now. That company collects a lot of dividends. It doesn't pay any dividends. The reason it doesn't pay any dividends is Warren Buffett doesn't want to be generating tax bills for himself <laughs> and all his friends. They will do share buybacks though. So instead of paying a dividend, they will buy take some of their money and buy their own shares on the open market, which tends to raise the price of them. 
A lot of companies do that these days, and you don't want to be investing only in companies that pay dividends and avoiding companies like Berkshire Hathaway just because it doesn't pay a dividend. It, it, it ends up being a, a, a suboptimal choosing process. Now there are well, let's let's not talk about factor investing right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want to mention too here that I just recently posted an article on dividend investing to the Facebook group on Catching Up to Fi. I thought it was pretty good. What did you think? Yeah, that was um, Alan Miller's article. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I th- I did think that was a a, a good article, and um, well, he listens to my podcast, so that's nice. <laughs> so he has, he, he, has, he has to be an expert. <laughs> he, 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 I mean, he's a financial advisor. By definition, if you listen to Frank's podcast, you're either overwhelmed or you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> you're insane, gold member. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Talking about the nonsensical... The last couple of topics before we toss to talk about your podcast, people as late starters are interested in improving their safe withdrawal rate. Do you have a list of things that you can do with variable adjustment that you can do to increase your safe withdrawal rate? And you tell us by how much. Yeah, you, I've had, I can construct portfolios that over the past hundred years have had a 5% safe withdrawal rate fairly easily. The, I, I can give you what the parameters of something like that exactly looks like, but I can also give you just some rules of thumb to for increasing your safe withdrawal rate. And I think we've we've t- maybe we've talked through those already. So if you want me to go to, let's see. Yeah, we did do a couple. Let's just summarize them for our audience. So that- yeah. So so the rule on the rules of thumb. Generally, you want between 40 and 70% of your stock, of your assets, your invested assets in stock funds, equities. I'm talking about index funds. There's a, Paul Merriman has a nice page with recommended index funds for all different categories of things. I would take a look at that if you're wondering which ones to go with. So that, that can be all domestic or you could, you could have domestic and international. International really doesn't affect these things that much because it's more of a speculation on the U.S. dollar than anything else. So, but after you take 40 to 70% in equities, File, Bing, and others have found that is kind of the sweet spot for a higher safe withdrawal rate for a portfolio. You want to have at least half of that tilted towards value. And so a fund like that will say small cap value on it or large cap value or just value. All of those stocks, by the way, all of those generally pay higher dividends if, you, if, you, if you're looking for that correlation, although it doesn't really matter. But the but if half of your portfolio is tilted that way, you're going to have a better performance. And that that is the basis for all of Paul Merriman's stuff. It's the basis for a lot of what Larry Suedro talks about and a lot of academics talk about. As I said, you should use treasury bonds as your bonds. Um, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to have to ditch the total bond fund because it's got corporates in it. Uh, fortunately, there are lots and lots of different bond funds now. And Vanguard has released a whole suite of, of ETFs. Of, so you can get your longer term ones, your intermediate term ones, or your shorter term ones. And you can create whatever mixture of those you want. And they're all cheap. They're all available. It's, it's, it's not like it was 15 years ago where the only choice you really had was a, was a total bond fund. You have a lot more options now. I, I also mentioned that you have 10% or less in, in short-term assets, your CDs, money markets, all those sorts of things. It could include some short-term bonds. And then if you really want the, the, that little extra pop, you're, you're going to want to put 10 to 25% in alternatives. Then when I'm talking about alternatives, I'm talking about gold, I'm talking about Managed futures. I'm talking about those sorts of things. I know those aren't popular with the uh, the, the, the punditry in, in in DIY world. At least not not popular with most people. But if you look at what people in hedge funds are doing, the the Cliff Asnesses at AQR, the Ray Dalios, and even if you go back and look at what I call the the OG fire portfolios from the people I used to know at early retirement extreme. One is a guy named Tyler who runs portfolio charts 
and came up with a portfolio called the Golden Butterfly that works pretty well. Larry Swedro is big on these sorts of things. There's a lot of literature these days that shows that a small aspect of those kinds of things by itself is not very good. In a portfolio, it ends up reducing the overall volatility of the portfolio, thereby raising a, a safe withdrawal rate for, for these kinds of purposes. Um, those things can also be bought in funds and should be bought in funds. Do not go out and buy any physical precious metals. Do not get into that racket. <laughs> People selling <laughs> coins and bars and strange places. <laughs> and then and then charging you storage fees and all sorts of other things. And <laughs> they have ETFs for everything. If you're going to make investments in those sorts of things, use ETFs. Like I said, th- that is the icing on the cake that Bill Began has put together portfolios these days that are have about a five a four point seven percent safe withdrawal rate historically. Typically, simply by adjusting, putting those those small cap value funds in there, like I was mentioning, and using treasury bonds and maybe adding some commodities or some other things. I'm still waiting for him to to publish that work. Um, now, the other the, the other interesting thing to read about that is from. Big Earn Safe Withdrawal Rate series. Number 34 is about gold. And he did a 100-year analysis, which basically showed that if you put 10 to 15% of gold in a portfolio, it's going to increase its safe withdrawal rate, was, was the, the end result of that. Um, well, we may be getting a little bit beyond our audiences. Probably. <laughs> and, I'm, I, and I apologize for that, but you had to ask the question. Yeah, that's okay. It, it's good to know that there's more knowledge out there that once they re, re become an adult investor, that they can they can play a little bit. This could be your play portfolio a little bit. Uh, let's take a little word on as we start to wind up this podcast. Tell us what risk parity is exactly. And may, you mentioned the golden butterfly portfolio just for fun, given it increases your safe withdrawal rate. Can you tell us what those two terms are uh, before we close the podcast today? Yeah, risk parity really refers to uh, what is called the holy grail principle. And I could have used holy grail, but then nobody people nobody would have known that the thing was about investing. They would have think, thought it was about religion or Monty Python. So, so I picked risk parity, which comes from Ray Dalio and Bridgewater. There is a nice video where he explains the Holy Grail principle, which is the idea that if you want to increase the performance of a portfolio, you need to focus on having uncorrelated investments and looking at specifically what are the correlations of all of your investments. Because the more uncorrelated they are, the more stable your portfolio will be with retaining a decent return resulting in our case, when you're talking about decumulation and a higher safe withdrawal rate, the other place where that comes from, and this is now well accepted in academic and professional spheres, but has not come all the way down to the DIY sphere yet. There is a book called the perfect portfolio that came out a few years ago, written by, Professor either, I think he's at MIT. I want to say his name is Albert Lowe. But he went back and interviewed everybody from Harry Markowitz, who was the originator of modern portfolio theory and Bogle and other people who are professionals and academics. And after interviewing all those people and figuring out how they invest, he came to the one conclusion, which was, what do all of these people say or have in common? It is this holy grail principle that in order to maximize your performance with lower risk. You want to focus on diversifying your portfolio across assets and within asset classes. So across within asset classes would be saying, okay, I'm going to have some value tilted stocks. That's a way of diversification within an asset class. Across asset classes, you're looking at, all right, I'm not just going to look at bonds by themselves. I'm going to look at which bonds are the least correlated with my stocks and that those that kind of diversification is the main principle that i'm trying to get 
across with risk parity radio. The other principles we talk about and use there are the simplicity principle and the macro allocation principle. The simplicity principle you're probably most familiar with, uh, simple path to wealth is an example, is a formula applying the simplicity principle, which says that let's make this as inexpensive (laughs) and easy to do as possible. If we can do something in an easy way or a hard way, let's pick the easy way. Let's pick the more, more efficient, less expensive way. And then the macro allocation principle comes from chapters 18 and 19 of Jack Bogle's Common Sense Investing. And that says that if you're looking at a bunch of portfolios, the, 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 that main macro allocation, that if it's 60-40, all the 60-40 portfolios are going to be similar in performance. All the 70-30 portfolios are going to be similar in performance. That, that one part of the allocation, what is the big picture, determines a lot of what is going on. Now, obviously, if you have more than just stocks and bonds, then you end up with, well, I'm having 60, 30, 10 or something. But that idea that that you're probably not going to get lots of variation simply by fiddling around with a whole bunch of different stock funds in your stock portion of your portfolio. Get the diversification you need. You don't need 10 funds. You can use three funds probably or two funds to get that. Okay, so you wanted to to hear about the golden butterfly, and this was a portfolio that was invented by one of my OG five friends from early retirement extreme named Tyler. I actually don't know his last name. He's an an engineer, but he came up with portfolio charts. And this portfolio is a conservative portfolio. It has 40% in stocks divided into two funds, essentially a total market fund like VTI and a small cap value fund. VIOV would be an example of that. It's got 40% in treasury bonds divided into long-term treasury bonds and short-term treasury bonds. In Vanguard speak, that would be VGLT and VGSH. And the remaining 20% is in gold, which I think is probably more than should be in gold, but that's what he's got in that portfolio. That portfolio has close to a 5% safe withdrawal rate historically. And he's used it for many years and lots of other people have begun to to, to focus on that because it, it does have, it, it is pleasant to hold. Even in the most unpleasant year, like last year was, I think it's worst year in ever in 50 years. I think it was down 11%, something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it, it is a viable choice for somebody who wants to maximize their withdrawals uh, in retirement. Um, uh, and he's not the only person that uses something like that. But that is that, that I know that is not popular right now in do-it-yourself investing. I think maybe in ten years people will be thinking more about more of these options because, frankly, these options were not available twenty years ago in any reasonable form. Um, now that we have all of these ETFs, I liken this to, to a golden era of investing because we have so many different options and they're cheap. And they're cheap. So the so now I've rambled on on that for a while. <laughs> you know, Frank, I, I'm so glad that, that you've covered a lot of this because I can see where there are lots of options. There's choices for those people that want to dig deep and go down the rabbit hole of the different asset allocations and different opportunities there are for investing. And then on the other side is where I sit, which is the simplicity. I yep. like the, the KISS principle because I don't want to spend, especially now in retirement, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure this out. I want to set up something that's simple that I can monitor, but I'm not having to manage. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear you talk about the fact that either one of these paths is going to work out. Yeah, yeah. You do have to match your withdrawals to whatever you're holding, but there are many paths that will work. And it, it, even if you if you surveyed all the people that you've had on this podcast that are retired, their portfolios are all over the map. <laughs> but since their withdrawals are, are are underneath whatever their safe withdrawal rate is, it's, it's, uh, it'll work out fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Frank, we are going to wrap up today. We have really, really enjoyed 
all of the information that you've shared with us. I know that it's, it's been a lot, and but the good news is folks can go back and listen to this multiple times. I can see now the show notes are going to be very long <laughs> and very comprehensive. <laughs> and we'll be sure that we have SpongeBob in the show notes. <laughs> So, yeah, and I and I, I do actually run these portfolios in real time, a number of them, including the Golden Butterfly on, on my as part of my podcast and website, just so people can see if I actually held this, what would it be like? And, and what would it be how, if showing examples of, well, how do we withdraw from this thing? I mean, it's a real live portfolio that I keep at Fidelity, uh, seven of them. So and, but that's part of what we do over there. So tell us how folks can connect with you. We've talked a lot about Risk Parity Radio. So give us the specifics. Yeah, that it has its own website, www.riskparityradio.com. And that is P-A-R-I-T-Y, not P-A-R-O-D-Y. Although you might get confused. <laughs> Actually, that's more appropriate. <laughs> so, because I, one thing that you're famous for on the podcast, and another really good reason to listen to it, is the rants. The Frank Vesquez rants. You haven't ranted today. Well, a little bit, but just not as long as you usually do. Yeah, well, I have, I have certain clips and things we play for certain kinds of financial advisors. So for, for the annuity salespeople... We go with with Alec Baldwin from Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Always be closing. <laughs> Only one thing that counts in this life: get them to sign on the line which is dotted. <laughs> <laughs> and also Ned Ryerson from Groundhog Groundhog Day. <laughs> am I right or am I right or am I right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you have any single premium life insurance? I really think that could be the ticket for you. <laughs> and then for our AUM friends, we go with Daniel Day Lewis's character in what is it called? There will be blood. I think so. The, the one where he played the oil man. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's a scene where he's talking to the other guy about how he's gonna drink his milkshake with a straw. <laughs> <laughs> I have a straw. There it is. <laughs> My straw reaches across the room. <laughs> it starts to drink your milkshake. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. <laughs> I drink it up. <laughs> Uh, I, I can see that uh, we have the, the sound bites for the beginning have, of the show here. <laughs> crystal balls. I mean, we have a lot of fun. I actually have listeners who have created Excel spreadsheets and they sit around trying to identify where all these clips came from. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's some really weird people that listen to my podcast. <laughs> it's really not for, it's really not for everybody. We were, we're, we're small, but mighty. Um, well, a fly in your mind with all of the little gifts and quips and comments, I'd like to be there because you have an amazing recall for all these little things that are entirely appropriate for the, the kinds of questions that people ask sometimes that are repetitive and, and they're hilarious. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, uh, believe it or not, I've always had things like that running through my head at all times, little songs, things out of movies. <laughs> and, I, and I thought everybody was like that. And then I realized, no. <laughs> <laughs> Something very wrong with us. <laughs> Your wife is a very special person. I bet. <laughs> she is. And, and Mary reads the, the emails on the podcast. And uh, when we have a particularly long one, then I play, Mary, Mary, why you bugging? <laughs> <laughs> but she corrects the grammar and and, and laughs at me, and, and we have we have fun that way. It it it, it is very gratifying that that she's able to participate in that because my my podcast is really not a commercial creation. It is intended as a retirement hobby and will always stay that way. 
<laughs> well, I, yeah, and, and they can find you at Risk Parity Radio. You have an email at Frank at Risk Parity Radio. That's right. You also have a charity you like uh, supporting. Can you mention that to our audience too, in case they want to support it as well? Yes, and th- this is also on the support page at, at the website, uh, www.riskpartyradio.com. This is the Father McKenna Center. It is a small charity um, on Capitol Hill in D.C., and it serves hungry, hungry and homeless people there. I am on the board. I'm the treasurer of the organization. And so we do collect money directly, and you can donate directly. But we also, I, I, a lot of my listeners are patrons on Patreon and donate a little bit every month, and we collect it and, and donate it that way. So any, 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 that, that, that's why there are no sponsors on, we don't have any sponsors on my podcast. We only have a charity and that's, that's, that's where we're going to stay because that's also trying to integrate my podcast with the rest of the rest of my life. And so, and this month is actually our biggest fundraising month for the Father McKenna Center. We have what's called the Walk for McKenna. We are doing that on September 30th this year. And that is just a walk around the center in that area of, of uh, that's north of the capital in the neighborhood. And it's essentially where Father McKenna used to walk. He was a, a priest that just served all of the homeless people who lived around there for, for many years. He actually lived up in the loft of the church. But the, so he's, I mean, a, a fantastic role model for, for all of us, really. And, and so anyway, if you're interested in supporting that, you can come walk with me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll buy you. I'll buy you lunch after that. You get a free, you get a free T-shirt. The T-shirt does have Risk Parity Radio on it because we've collected enough donations from the podcast to actually get the the name of the podcast on on the teach on the, on the T-shirt this year as a major donor. But we're, we're going to continue that work and. I hope if you listen to the podcast, you will also contribute there. The one thing you get for contributing to that is your emails go to the front of my email queue. Most of my podcasts these days involve answering emails from various listeners. And some of these emails are three pages long. <laughs> and take an hour to answer. So, but. But if you've donated to the Father McKenna Center, I am going to answer that and put it at the top of the list. But that that is the the only perk that you can you can get at Risk Parity Radio. But it's a very worthwhile perk for for, for many people who want to hear me. No, we 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 love your rants. We love your information. We love your wisdom and your humor. You've ex- exhibited all of that today on the show. We'll probably run this in its entirety. People are going to have to break it up because we just can't. St- find a place to stop here. It, it just, it just no, you, you, you really can't. And I'm happy to come back some other time. Maybe if you want to collect some questions. The, I mean, the other place you can find me would be at, at your website or your, your page on Facebook, Catching Up to Fi or the Choose That Fi group. I frequently comment in there. But if you. Oh, here we go. What we can do is create a thread where the day is devoted to Ask Frank. <laughs> <laughs> on a weekly basis you could be our dear frank like dear abby and yeah. you could help folks you could help folks just figure it out and before i forget please drop your father mckenna walk and charity into the facebook group uh, we are trying to have meetups and this could be an awesome meetup there are going to be people in the dc area and maybe they want to join you on the walk or maybe they want to have a meetup and meet frank in person that's right that would be that would be great i have met a number of uh, my listeners in person and what's interesting about them is that they're actually all over the world for for for, for whatever reason my podcast gets listened to people in japan and germany and <laughs> portugal and all, all sorts of places <laughs> but it's gratifying when whenever I have contact with because the one of the other purposes of my podcast is simply to make new friends. All right. Well, Frank, we have enjoyed this so much today and we will I know that we're going to hear from you early and often in the different Facebook groups. And uh, so when when you're answering a question, I want the audience to know that they need to, in their mind, they need to add a voice, a Frank voice to that answer <laughs> as they're reading it. 
<laughs> Pick a voice. Keep the keep the humor coming. We 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 love it. It's not about it's not all about money. It is about humor because life is funny. Right. That is true. And and if I if I may, I will leave you with uh, one more quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is tends to be my guidepost in most things. And this quote answers the question, what is success? To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate the beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Ralph Waldo Emerson. That is awesome. And that is a perfect place to close. We'll look forward to catching up to Fi with you again soon. Thanks again, Frank. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Fi. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.